Welcome to First Presbyterian Church, Salina, Kansas, where led by Christ, together in faith and love, we joyfully think, question, grow, and serve. For those joining online or by way of KINA Radio, welcome. There's an order of worship available at fpcsalina.org for you to worship with us. Let us worship God. As you are able, please stand and join in our call to worship, which is based on Psalm 27, verse 1. Steady our steps, O God, as we travel the journey set before us. Keep us on your course of life as we seek to be faithful. As we gather to praise you, our faithful Lord and God. Let us worship God. Please remain standing as we join in our opening song, number 444, Forgive Our Sins As We Forgive. Please be seated. Into the shadows of our isolation, God speaks the words of life and community. Through God's graceful healing presence, God redeems our woundedness and restores us to wholeness. Trusting in God's gracious provision, let us together confess our limitations and proclaim God's faithfulness. Generous God, we are baptized as your people called to live and serve together as your church. We confess that we have sought to live for ourselves, not reaching out to others and honoring the divine image in all your children. Forgive us, we pray. In your abundant mercy, give us the grace to be your church, confessing our faults, offering forgiveness, and working for reconciliation. Turn our hearts to your intentions that we may hold fast to one another and draw near to your presence. In Jesus, we ask it. Amen. Friends, in Jesus Christ, we have been fed God's grace and redemption. And that redemption gives us the strength to love our neighbors near and far, proclaiming in our words and deeds, in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven.
How are you guys today? Good. Good. Um, I bet some of you know what this is. Have you seen this before? Okay, um, you've probably seen these in the pews where you sit. Some people use these to place their offering in each week, each week, and then they put it in the plate. Although we do have a number of what you hear weekly, we have a number of different ways that people can offer, uh, present their offering. Giving an offering to God is a very important part of worship. Most of you have probably brought an offering today. There are many places in the Bible that teach us the importance of presenting an offering to God. But the truth is that God's more interested in what's in our heart than what's in our hand. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, if you are presenting your offering to God and you remember that you have said something that hurt someone else, leave your, leave your gift at the altar and go and ask forgiveness from the person. Then come back and offer your gift. Before we give our offering today, Perhaps we should ask ourselves a couple questions. Have we been angry at someone this week? Have we had arguments with people this week? Have you called someone a name this week? Is there something you've done to someone? Have you um, said something that was untrue about them? You'll see that we have spark, spots on our heart, don't we? If we've hurt someone, we should ask God for forgiveness, and we should go to that person and ask them to forgive us. When we do that, we clean our heart. And then we're ready to make our offering. And then God is pleased with our offering and with our clean heart. Let us pray. Dear God, sometimes we say things in anger that hurt other people. Help us to guard against hateful and hurtful words. And forgive us as we ask those we have hurt to forgive us as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, what the world says and what you say are often at odds. Set before us now your truth as we hear your word and as we respond in faithful trust. Amen. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I am commanding you today. By loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways, and observing his commandments, decreases and ordinances. Then you shall live and become numerous. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you do not hear, but are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are crossing Jordan to enter the the, the yeah the possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying him and holding fast to him. For that means life to you and length of days so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to give to your ancestors to Abraham to Isaac and to Jacob the grass withers the flower fades but the word of our God will stand forever thanks be to God
This week, we conclude a three-week look at the Sermon on the Mount. Due to the fact that Easter's place on the calendar fluctuates year to year, means that Lent begins in 10 days, so we will not make our way, our whole way, through Jesus' sermon. But what we have heard is a good introduction to what Jesus values most as he shares his hopes for how we are to form a community he calls the kingdom of God. Curiously, though, the Sermon on the Mount offers little about what we are to understand about our faith as a matter of belief. Instead, it is more about what we must do as we relate to God and one another. The trajectory of Jesus' most famous sermon begins with the other-focused nature of ministry through the Beatitudes, then moves through our call to be salt and light, and arrives today at how we are to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. That is how we are to bring ourselves into right relationship with God and one another, by looking inwards in order to see others with the eyes of God's love. Please open your heart, mind, and spirit to listen for God's word to us from the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 to 37. You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder. And whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him, or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you'll be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of unchastity, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. This is God's word to us. Throughout the nearly quarter century that I have been a pastor, one of the common threads I have heard in churches as varied as a small congregation in rural Kentucky, a suburban community on the front range of the Rockies, a downtown church in southern Idaho, and right here in central Kansas, is how readily people are to dismiss what they characterize as the Old Testament God of wrath. I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with congregants and well-meaning community members who are as drawn to Jesus as they are allergic to the notion of the Old Testament God. This perspective is problematic, however, because at best it dismisses two-thirds of the Bible 
And at its worst, it leads to anti-Semitic tropes that disparage those who are heirs with us with God's covenant. The one whose disciples called him rabbi did not mean to denigrate Judaism then any more than Jesus wants us to do so today. So what are we to do with a passage like the one before us this morning? I always wonder what people think of Jesus who says such startling things. After all, there are a host of rhetorical landmines covered in these verses. Who among us has not called someone fool or much worse? And how are we to hear challenging and hurtful topics around marital relations? Not only are there conversation-stopping topics in this long section of the Sermon on the Mount, but it is also easy to mis misconstrue the meaning and purpose of what we find here. We have to be careful to not hear Jesus dismissing what we find in the Old Testament. Jesus is not replacing what went before. In fact, just a few lines before this morning's passage, he said, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. Instead, what Jesus is doing here is intensifying the law of Moses. But Jesus was not the first student of what we call the Old Testament to do this, nor was he the last. Nothing Jesus says here is any different than what a rabbi in the first century or a rabbi in the 21st century would say about these matters. Jesus is not calling out the religion of his birth as being faulty, and neither should we. What Jesus is doing is pointing to a new way of life God has always intended for God's people. Teaching with authority, Jesus places before us the importance of concerning ourselves with maintaining a right relationship with God alongside striving for a right relationship with one another in our church. Jesus did not intend the Sermon on the Mount to establish a whole new set of rules, especially not exerting power over and against members of the community of faith. Jesus' goal of raising the law of Moses in a new way is to point us toward how we see God and one another through a transformed heart, mind, and spirit. This new way of life is a summons to a radical kind of love. It is not enough to say, I have not murdered anyone. Jesus wants us to look deeper. All those times we explode with anger when cut off by another driver, busily talking or texting on their phone, how easily we dismiss those with whom we disagree on a whole host of issues, and words we wish we could reel back in when we see how they wound loved ones. Jesus knows how easily we dehumanize those who are made in the image and likeness of God. The concern of Jesus' sayings on anger is less of having anger than what we do with that anger. Does anger shape our relationships or prevent us from restoring broken relationship? Even more than all the ways we blurt out disbelief at others' driving skills or quietly simmer about others' perceived ignorance, Jesus is concerned about how we treat one another within the body of Christ. If we have lashed out in anger or are holding a grudge against one another here within the community of faith, before we think about being in right relationship with God, we're to think about the quality of relationships we have with one another. When someone presented offerings at the altar, they were seeking God's grace and mercy. But here Jesus is saying, first seek one another's forgiveness before looking for restoration with God. Imagine how difference, different our experience of life within the community of faith would be if we were not only concerned about our one-on-one -on -one relationship with God in Christ, but also sought to ensure that there is wholeness among one another. How much richer would life be that we find here at church? 
That is what Jesus meant when he said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. We're to be as concerned about how we relate to those who sit on our right and on our left as we are in wondering about our place within God's embrace. Working for well-being and relationship with one another is only magnified when thinking about how those who are called to intimate relationship relate to one another. But here Jesus does something surprising. Did you notice how Jesus switches from talking about everyone to to, uh, everyone within the community of faith to just half the population? When it comes to how Jesus wants us to think about adultery and divorce, he calls men and boys to look within ourselves before we look out at the women and girls in our life. Jesus' concern is to ensure that one half of the population does not take advantage of the other half who are made in the image and likeness of God. Jesus underscores the place of women and girls in the heart of God to the point of abandoning those of us who are male to tear out or cut off eye or hand rather than for the whole body to be thrown into hell. Such is the gravity of the new way of life Jesus calls us to put on in the depth of God's love. New Testament scholar Amy Jill Levine says, by collapsing the distinction between thought and action, this extension of the law against adultery to include lust suggests that no one should be regarded as an object. The burden here is placed on us men. Women are not to be seen as responsible for enticing sexual misadventure. The new life to which Jesus calls us is one where we stop blaming women for their wardrobe and start asking men and boys to examine our heart when relating to half the population who are made in the image and likeness of God. But not only does Jesus call men and boys to a new way of life, so too does Jesus call us all to examine how we understand marriage, especially when marriage ends. Jesus' challenging words about divorce here are not meant to be one more stone of shame for those whom marriage has become a burden. While marriage points to God's ultimate will for two people, there are numerous instances in which marriage is no longer valid, whether because of infidelity, neglect, abuse, failure to communicate, or simply unresolved tensions regarding reciprocal expectation. Jesus understood that broken relationships are part of our human experience. What Jesus is doing here is putting women on equal footing with men. In that patriarchal world, women were viewed as property. The Tenth Commandment says as much when it places wives alongside slaves, oxen, donkeys, or anything that belongs to our neighbor that we're not to covet. But here, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus places the concern of wives alongside the concern of husbands. While every effort should be made to redeem fractured marriages, some must be acknowledged as beyond repair. In such cases, divorce may be not only the lesser of two evils from the point of view of God's ultimate will, but also a positive step, one in which both former partners move into a new way of life where wholeness is restored. This new way of life is possible for us all when we reorient our heart, mind, and spirit to being centered on Jesus Christ and not centered on a list of commands that stand outside of us. Focusing within as the birthplace for how we interact with those around us is a move not only made in the fifth chapter of Matthew, but also in the scout law that we will hear in a little while. As I was putting together the scout law litany 
into our order of worship. I was struck by what I found there, of who scouts say they are, is so much more than a simple checklist of things to avoid. Among the interior values that scouts are to embody are being trustworthy, helpful, kind, obedient, cheerful, and brave. These ways of being form a new way of life, like what we find in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. I imagine that scoutmasters hope that scouts not only follow this scout law when they put on their uniform and head to church for weekly activities. So too do their leaders hope that this scout law becomes the basis for how scouts live out their lives when they take off their uniforms and head out into the world. The same could be said for what Jesus has to say about anger, adultery, divorce, oaths, and more. Jesus will go on to say that we are to embody kingdom living by maintaining wholeness within the community of faith, by letting go of cycles of retaliation as we turn the other cheek and learn the benefits of loving not just friends and family, but our enemies. Both the scout law and Jesus' teachings are meant to show us a new way of life that honors both God and those we are called into relationship. While the Old Testament will continue to confound and confuse on many levels, so too does Jesus put before us challenging ideas for how best to live, especially his expectations for how we are to live among one another. So may we not only think about how we have avoided such things as murder, but consider the motivation of our heart, mind, and spirit. How with Jesus' teachings at work in us, we discover a new way of life, one that grants us access to the fullness of life found within God's embrace and among the company of God's children, called to be the kingdom of God here and now. Please join me in prayer. God of blessing, you call us to be one with you and your creation in love, faithfulness, and truth. Help us carry out the vows we make to adore you with our whole heart, to live in mutual support of one another, and to love as if your kingdom has fully come. Amen. I'd like to invite Jack and Marshall to stand up to the microphone there, please. And join with me as we, uh, pastor and scouts, go through the scout law with some scripture. All right. You can follow along in your bulletins, or it may pop up on the screen. We'll see. The scout law is a guiding light to millions of scouts throughout the world today. But the principles of the law have been brought to us from ancient days. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. That is trustworthy. Very little is faithful also in much. And whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. Since there will never cease to be some in need on the earth, I therefore command you, open your hand to the poor and needy, needy neighbor in your land. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up as there is need so that your words may give grace to those who hear. The righteous know the needs of their animals, but the mercy of the wicked is cruel. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. A glad heart makes a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of heart the spirit is broken. The mind of one who has understanding seeks knowledge, 
but the mouths of fools feed on folly. All the days of the poor are hard, but a cheerful heart has a continual feast. A scout is cheerful. Go to the ant, you lazy bones. Consider its ways and be wise. Without having any chief or officer or ruler, it prepares its food in summer and gathers its sustenance in harvest. A scout is thrifty. Be strong and bold. Have no fear of dread of them, because it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. A scout is brave. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? Those who have clean hands and pure hearts, who do not lift up their souls to what is false, and do not swear deceitfully, they will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from the God of their salvation. A scout is clean. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. A scout is reverent toward God, faithful in religious duties and respects the convictions of others in matters of custom and religion. Please stand as you're able and join in singing number 372, O for a world. <laughs> Please be seated. I'd like to ask, don't sit, Randy. Randy Graham to come over here, and Amy and Jeremiah Cole and Kathy Price to come down uh, front. We had a new members conversation yesterday, and uh, these folks are joining today and are, were joined by Action of Session yesterday, and uh, two, two others who are getting married in uh, April and a couple who was still exploring what they uh, want to think about church membership. I didn't bring a microphone. It's the one right. thing I stand up there, I totally forgot the microphone. Right. So there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. On behalf of the session, I present Amy and Jeremiah Cole, who have been received into the membership of this congregation by reaffirmation of faith, and Kathy Price by letter of transfer. Kathy, Amy, and Jeremiah, trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? If so, please respond, I do. Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, trusting in his grace and love? If so, please respond, I do. I do. Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his, obeying his word and showing his love? If so, please respond, I will with God's help. I will, with God's help. will you be a faithful member of this congregation, share in its worship and ministry through your prayers and gifts, your study and service, and so fulfill your calling to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. 
If so, please respond, I will with God's help. Let us pray. Holy God, we praise you for calling us to be your servant people and for gathering us into the body of Christ. We thank you for choosing to add to our number Amy, Jeremiah, and Kathy, our siblings of faith. Together may we live in your spirit and so love one another that we may have the mind of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom we give honor and glory forever. Amen. Please make sure you welcome these fine folks uh, in worship and afterwards. The flowers in the chancel are given by uh, Betsy Scolden in memory of Jim Scolden and Margie and James Hall. Today, after worship in the conference room, uh, Randy Graham will be leading a discussion of uh, Theo Ed video titled The Death and Resurrection of Sacred Speech. Uh, Jonathan Merritt is the speaker on that video. For Lent, our front office uh, administrator and communications person, Nicole Olson, is uh, wanting to solicit your help. We all have photo albums on our telephones, and so our Lenten uh, devotional is from the Presbyterian Outlook, and it's going to look at six different themes, fear, pain, joy, dishonesty, burdens, and love. And we're asking that if you have photos on your phone that uh, are reflective of those different themes, to please email Nicole or text her the picture. Uh, the email's nicole at fpcsalina.org. Next Sunday, February 19th, immediately following worship, we'll have our annual congregational meeting downstairs in Blair Hall. A meal is being uh, catered and delivered, and uh, you're all invited to join us as we partake of that feast and hear about the life and ministry of our congregation over the past year. And I didn't bring my hat today because I thought that might be a bit much, but um, I encourage you to uh, share donations or canned goods, and if you didn't bring them, place them on either end for the Chiefs or another team that's uh, mentioned down there uh, to cheer on the Super Bowl for the Super Bowl of caring here in Salina. If you've not already assigned the uh, friendship pads, please assign those and pass them along the way. Let us pray. God of grace and steadfast love, we thank you for our life and that we share it in community. We thank you for calling us to ministries of hope and compassion. We pray for your grace to do all that you ask of us, to choose life, to love you and our neighbors without reserve, not half-heartedly, but with our whole selves. Holy God, we bring before you the cares, the concerns, and the joys that occupy us. We remember before you those who are at odds with one another, in families, in neighborhoods or offices, in communities and in the church, and across political aisles and deep-seated division. We pray for nations in the midst of internal and external conflicts and all those who suffer because of the conflict and violence and terror. We remember before you today those who have physical needs, people who fear for their safety and well-being, people who are hungry or thirsty, people who are exhausted by the demands of work or caregiving, people who are sick or who will undergo surgery, and people who live with chronic pain. Bring relief and rest, we pray. We remember those weighed down with needs of heart and soul, a worry that keeps us awake at night, grief that accompanies us everywhere we go, depression that clouds us, or addiction that grips us and those we love. Lift all these heavy burdens with the light and peace of your presence, we pray. Sustain us over the long journey toward health and wholeness, and give us trust in you, ourselves, and those who love us. We remember before you not only our cares, but also our joys, all the things that are life-giving, a birthday celebrated, an anniversary enjoyed, 
a baby born, a new job, a new relationship, a new day of your mercies. We give thanks that with you there is always a new beginning, a way where there is no way, hope beyond hope and life beyond death. Give us the courage to trust you as we choose your life-giving path, praying as you teach us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for your support of the ongoing ministry of First Presbyterian Church. In your worship bulletin, there is a list of the numerous ways you can respond to the abundant gifts of God in our life. God's word finds fertile ground each time we choose life, each time we share the gifts of God's grace and love. Let us gather our gifts and offer them to God in gratitude and praise. Please listen now to our offertory music.
Let us pray. Generous God, you have planted the seeds of generosity into our hearts, and by your grace, you give the growth through our actions and response. Receive the fruit of your mercy and the offerings of our lives, and use the, these gifts to grow your harvest of justice and mercy. Amen. Please remain, remain standing as we sing number 543, God be the love to search and keep me. Through God's word in Jesus Christ, we have been given a new way of life. May the Holy Spirit lead you ever onwards into that way in all you say and do. Amen. <laughs> 